Hello everyone, my name is Petya and I will be talking today about one interesting product we have in Skyscanner. Uh, this short video will take you on a journey that we went through when trying to keep up with the ever-increasing load in our systems. Uh, because of this constantly growing load, we had to completely redesign our product several times over the years um, or it would just stop working. So buckle up and uh, let's go. So what product am I talking about? In internally we code Browse. Browse is a product that provides indicative prices for um, travelers and partners. These prices are used in many different aspects of our site and app. Here on the screenshot you can see map view, browse view, even a Google ad that provides information using prices uh, from Browse. Uh, to spice up your interest, I'll share a few numbers of where we are right now with the load. So we're currently processing about hundreds of thousands of price updates per second. Uh, we have thousands of requests per second. And we have a global data set that is unified across all regions in the world. We also have 64 different query types that are uh, being served to our customers. From a really high level view, this box with a question mark is what we are trying to build. We continuously receive prices from hundreds of airlines and travel agencies. We have to process them somehow and store so that we could answer questions like what's the cheapest day to fly in June? Or what is the cheapest month to fly in? Or what is the cheapest destination in Spain to fly? So now that you more or less understand the problem, let's discuss the things we tried that did and did not work over the years. So we started with a simple SQL table. Each row representing one quote, one price from an airline or travel agency. Pretty simple, huh? Um, do you think it worked? Well, yes, for a while at least. After some time we started to have more and more users, more users make more queries, more prices be converted into our table and the table grows. And when the table became very large, the queries became very slow, even with indices. So we had to build something smarter. The second idea was very similar to the first one. We decided to pre-compute all the results for every query type, but still store everything in one SQL database. So whenever we get a price update, we checked. Is it now the cheapest flight per city? If yes, we update the table. Is it the cheapest per country? If yes, we update another table. Is it the cheapest per month? And so on and so forth, for 64 different types of aggregations. We tried being very smart this time. We had update queues, we had cascading updates across many aggregations. We tried cream of the crop hard drives, even Fusion IO drives that are plugged into video card port. Did it work? It sure did but again, only for a couple of years. And then it started falling apart because now we had too many writes. Still, every price update had to be written to every single database. The third idea was a totally new architecture. We learned our lessons. We wanted to build something that didn't have an obvious bottleneck and something that could be scaled horizontally. Our input was the same, a firehose of quotes, that comes into our system from our partners and airlines. But this time, instead of saving them to a database, we just buffer the quotes for a couple of minutes and then persist them to AWS S3 as a file. With that, we end up with hundreds relatively small files per day. We then want to use Apache Spark to do all of our data aggregations and persist the results into some read-optimized database that travelers could query directly. To keep things simple, we also decided to only run our data processing batch job once every 30 minutes. Now, our total data set size is in the terabytes range. So recreating the entire data set every 30 minutes sounds a little bit crazy. So instead, we decided to create diffs of the changes every 30 minutes and persist in only those diffs. Do you think this worked? No, not even a little bit. There were several complications. First, what database do we use as a read store? Redis could work, but we quickly found out that with our size of data, 
keeping everything in memory would quickly become prohibitively expensive. Amazon Aurora could work. Aurora is a managed database provided by AWS. Um, it's essentially MySQL or Postgres, but with built-in sharding and super fast replication. It sounds great, but there is one problem. We still need to write all our data to a single master node every 30 minutes. And we know by then that this just wouldn't work. And even if it did, we then realized, what if our diffs get corrupted? Doesn't matter what database technology we use for the read store, if we introduce a single bug in our aggregation logic and corrupt a single diff, there is simply no way for us to roll back. The operational overhead of running such a system would be catastrophic. So we decided to try a different thing. Let's not do any diffs. Let's also not use any read store. Let's just output the entire data set into S3 every 30 minutes and build an API that would serve user requests by directly querying data in S3. Sounds crazy, I know. Do you think it worked? Yes, yes, it worked this time. Of course, it was a little bit more complicated than that. We had to encode our data in S3 in specially designed protobuf files and also generate a special partition map index file. Using this partition map, the API could fetch the exact byte range it needed from the files in S3 to satisfy user requests. We also put the Redis cache in front of S3, but it was just a regular cache, not a full database. It was holding a small portion of the most frequently used data. So did we do wasteful work with this design? Certainly. Every time our job ran, it produced an entirely new version of the whole dataset. However, we found out that storage in S3 is a lot cheaper than paying for a database, even though we were producing an order of magnitude more data than with the previous approach. We got other benefits too. For example, no need to have any backups, no need to worry about data migrations. We just make any code changes in our aggregation logic, deploy them, and in 30 minutes, we'll have our new dataset produced. All in all, we are very happy with the final result and the current solution is powering Skyscanner's browse product even now. To close this off, here are some lessons learned. Everything must be linearly scalable and redundant. Optimize as late as possible. Burn money if you can afford it. The later you start optimizing, the more impactful every optimization will be. We wasted time on producing diffs in an attempt to optimize something that we didn't really need to. Design systems so that they don't need support. Your product should be able to scale faster than your organization. A team should be able to maintain more and more services as they build them without losing productivity on supporting and maintaining the previously built services. And also crazy designs like using S3 as high throughput database can actually work sometimes. And they might be your best option. So verify with your vendor. And that's the end of our journey so far. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.